All right, good morning, ladies. The signing sheet will be going around. We left off on um, Friday with uh, this picture here. This is a, a image. It's basically a picture and then a cartoon of what it would look like if we took a whole blood sample. So we could take the uh, anti-cubital vein and pull blood directly out of that, spin it down with a centrifuge, which is basically is a piece of equipment in the lab that spins us uh, a tube or a, a test tube in a circle really, really fast. Heavy things will get pulled to the bottom. Lighter things will float up towards the top. Now, you can also just actually take blood and just set it out on the table and come back about 24 hours later, and the heavy red blood cells will falling down to the bottom of the tube as well. So you don't necessarily have to centrifuge. That just makes it happen in five minutes rather than 24 hours. So from the whole blood sample, when we centrifuge it, we end up with these three distinct layers. Now, I'm going to work from the bottom and I'm going to work my way up. So again, this is going to be at the bottom the heaviest material that's in the blood. And the bottom layer of the blood sample is going to be a very bright red. And the reason it's very bright red is because this is where we find the red blood cells, which means a high iron content, which has a red color. We call this bottom layer the hematocrit. And the hematocrit is going to consist of our red blood cells. And I'm just going to abbreviate that RBC. For most humans, uh, under normal physiological circumstances, anywhere from 37% to 52% of a whole blood sample should account for the hematocrit. Now, how are we actually getting those numbers? Well, this is a vacutainer tube, and it will pull out an exact precise uh, volume of blood. Most of the time, it's something like five mils for a purple top uh, tube. And then you would expect to see of that five mils, whatever that 37% is, so five mils, you're looking at... 2.4 milliliters of that um, of that uh, five mil volume to get the, the total volume there. So you just measure it off how much volume is there, and it should be between 37 and 52 percent. Now, red blood cells is the primary ingredient that we find here in the hematocrit. And just before we go on from here, and we're going to come back and talk about each of these in a little bit more detail. The hematocrit is also, I'm sorry, the red blood cell is also named, known as the erythrocyte. And these erythrocytes are oxygen carrying component in the bloodstream. So under microscopy, these are going to be a discoid shaped cell. Uh, again, they're packed full of hemoglobin and another enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. Hemoglobin helps to regulate oxygen levels in the blood. Carbon carbonic anhydrase is going to uh, help to maintain pH in the blood. This is the uh, enzyme that actually converts carbon dioxide into carbonic acid to help regulate levels of pH in the bloodstream. Now kind of going back here just to slide back to our centrifuge blood sample, you'll see that there is a middle layer that middle layer is a very, very small layer typically, but in this image here, you can actually see that this middle layer is actually very large. Normally, it's a very small, diffuse layer, and it's called the buffy coat. And that buffy coat is going to be where the white blood cells and the platelets are going to settle on it. So our white blood cells and our platelets, normal physiological condition, about 1% of that total volume is going to be the buffy coat, the leukocytes 
white blood cells and the platelets. Now, in this individual here, I'm guessing it's a raging infection. Uh, it could be a cancer patient because there's a large white blood cell com component. In fact, it's an enormous white blood cell component. Now, the, the white blood cells, we also call them leukocytes. So our WBCs will also be known as leukocytes. And the interesting thing here is the white blood cells are not really the most prominent in the bloodstream. We find white blood cells or leukocytes out in a variety of other tissues in much higher concentrations because they're involved in the immune defense. They just are transported in the bloodstream and so there's a small volume basically being shoveled around the circulatory system as those white blood cells are distributed to a variety of different uh, tissues in the body. The leukocytes, we're actually going to break these up and identify five different types. And these five types can be further grouped into two groups. So we have two main groups, and within those two main groups, a total of five different types of leukocytes. Now, the two different groups is going to be based off of whether or not you can see grains in the cell, granules in the cell. And so we're going to have some cells that you can, and those are going to be called granulocytes. And then we're going to have some that you can't, and those are going to be called agranulocytes. For the granulocytes, there are three types. And it's the, the name of these three types of leukocytes is based off of how they respond to staining procedures. Now, there are two different types of stains that are typically used in uh, in, in histological procedures, and they're called eosin and hematoxylin. And eosin is a red color and hematoxylin is a blue color. Okay, so just sort of keep that in mind. Um, if we put both of those dyes onto a sample of cells and they don't pick up either dye, so they stay neutral in color, but they have the grainy appearance, which you can actually see here, um, they're kind of a, a, have what looks like little crystallized pieces of sand or something inside of the cell. When they don't pick up the, the stain, we call these neutrophils. And basically it just means that they're neutral loving. That's what the neutrophil means. Uh, so they stay, they stay neutral. If the cell really likes Eosin, it's an asonophil, and it has this sort of reddish color because it picks up that uh, that particular dye, responds to it, so it loves that dye, so it's an asonophil. And then if it turns a blue color in the presence of the blue stain, we're going to call those basophils. And you can see here that the neutrophils don't really pick up the color. The asonophils are going to pick up that red color. The basophils are going to pick up the blue color from the blue dye. By the way, just so we're all on the same page, the basophil, if I stain it, try to stain it with eosin, it's not going to pick up the stain. All right, so there's our granulocytes. And again, just named after the fact that they sort of have this grainy appearance. And then there are two leukocytes that don't have a grainy appearance. And those are the granulocytes. And the agranulocytes uh, are going to include lymphocytes. And these lymphocytes can be further broken up into a B and a T. So we'd have B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. B lymphocytes are being produced in the bone. T lymphocytes are being produced in the thymus. Uh, so these lymphocytes typically have a relatively large mononucleated um, appearance. So one just big, large uh, uh, nucleus in the middle of the cell and no grains. The other 
type of white blood cell is the monocyte. And the monocyte is actually going to have a, uh, a, a sort of a weird looking nucleus. It almost looks more like a bean, almost like it's being bled apart or broken apart. Uh, so the lymphocyte, both have just a single nucleus. The lymphocyte typically has a big round nucleus. The monocyte has this more crescent shaped nuclei inside of the cell. All right, to go back here now, we have our final top layer. And the top layer typically is that yellowish color. And the top layer of our blood sample here is going to be what's called plasma. And this is basically the water component of the bloodstream with some dissolved proteins and solutes and gases. And this is going to be anywhere from 47 up to 63% in a normal individual uh, of the total of the total blood sample. So the yellowish color comes from just pigments that are present that are dissolved within the plasma. And by the way, the yellow colored urine is because some of those yellow colored pigments in the plasma make their way into the urine as we help to use the urinary system to regulate the uh, chemistry of the bloodstream. So it's a yellowish color, and again, it's primarily going to contain water. It is the watery extracellular fluid of the tissue that we call blood. But it's also going to contain, in addition to the water and the pigments I've already mentioned, dissolved elements. And those are going to include things like gases, carbon dioxide, and oxygen, certain small proteins, and you probably can already begin to think of what some of these proteins are going to be, and electrolytes. So dissolved gases, proteins, and electrolytes. Now, the plasma is interestingly, interesting enough that we should go ahead and take a little time to discuss this. So this is our most prominent component, typically, of, uh, of the blood sample. Um, and of the plasma, we're going to have, in addition to the water, a lot of protein as well. And those proteins that are going to be present are going to come in three different types. And we've already actually talked a little bit about some of these proteins when we were talking about transport, hormone transport. And uh, remember we had binding globulins that would bind onto the hormone and allow it to circulate in a bound form and then some of it would be in a free form. These are gonna be found in the plasma. in primarily three types that are going to be present. One of the kinds of protein that's present in the plasma is going to be called albumin. And albumins are transport uh, molecules and they help to transport things like solutes, and they help to buffer pH, to prevent large changes in the pH of, of the bloodstream. 
In addition to being uh, pH, related to pH buffering and also transportation of solutes, the albumins also contribute to the blood viscosity, which is a measure of thickness. Um, the, the, one of the places you've probably run into viscosity before is with motor oil. You all know that motor oils are named things like 10W30 or 5W30 or 20 weight, zero weight. And that's a measure of viscosity, and it's basically how thick is the, uh, the first number in the motor oil is how thick the motor oil is at room temperature, and then how thick it would be or how viscous it would be, sticky it would be at operating temperature of the engine. Okay, so your blood can also be kind of measured in that same sort of thickness or um, uh, viscous uh, way, and the the albumin is going to contribute to that viscosity and also to the osmolarity, which is a measure of dissolved solutes within a solution. Okay, so the globulins uh, are a second type of protein. Uh, these are involved in solute transport. Uh, immunity. And in the clotting response. Now the globulins are a little more extensively uh, classified. There are three subclasses, and these three subclasses are based off of the size of the globulin molecule. Once everybody gets this, I'm going to make an adjustment on my screen. So it's three subclasses, and the, the category that is used for classification is going to be size. Everybody have everything? Wait, so globulins are involved in solute transport, immunity, and clotting. Three, three subclasses, and those subclasses are based off the size of the of the molecule or of the protein. So three subclasses, the smallest are going to be called alpha globulins. So the smallest are the alpha globulins. Then we have sort of an intermediate middle size that are the beta globulins. And then we have an, uh, a largest category, which are going to be gamma. So the gamma globulins. The third type of protein that is present in the plasma are going to be proteins of the class fibrogen and fibrin. Now, hopefully, you see the word fiber in there, and that's because these are going to be used to form um, some fibrous structure in the plasma. So. This is an electromicrograph, and, and you can see red blood cells, and you see that distinct discoid shape, and then you get this thing that almost looks like a spider web. And that's actually the proteins fibrogen and fibrin. And these proteins are heavily involved in the clotting process as well. So these are going to be stimulated to form sort of a sticky structure like a spider web, that can grab things like red blood cells and even platelets like we have down here in the lower right hand corner. So clotting proteins and then these are also going to be uh, involved in, um, I guess that's not the best way to put this, whenever we prepare a uh, a tissue or a blood sample and we spin it down, we get that yellow liquid called plasma. 
But if we allow the fibrogens to activate, they're involved in removing other stuff of, uh, along with themselves, right? Because if I form this web-like structure, it becomes heavier and it'll get pulled down into the hematocrit. And we're left over when we when we allow that to happen. If we remove fibrin from our plasma sample, so basically, if we allow clots to form before we, and really what it is is we prevent clotting from happening and we get plasma. If we don't prevent clotting from happening by uh, in, uh, including a uh, another chemical like heparin in our blood sample, then we end up getting. Um, this, the, the clots that form, and rather than having plasma, we now have what's called serum. And serum is actually in a very important, from a molecular biology perspective, um, whenever we use anything for detecting hormones or proteins in the blood, we, we always are going to use serum samples. Whenever we generate antibodies or anti-sera, maybe you've heard that term before, which is a, a detection technique in molecular biology, we're using serum. We're getting rid of the effects of the fibrin from, from, the, from, the, from the blood sample. Okay, so those are the three types of proteins that are found predominantly in plasma. Plasma is also going to be the storage site for nitrogenous wastes. So it's going to be the plasma that interacts with the tissue of the kidney to clean up the nitrogenous waste or to clean up those waste products and remove those waste products. And so we, we uh, temporarily store those waste products in the, in the plasma. And so they're going to have a relatively high prevalence if we were to take a blood sample and try to detect nitrogenous waste we're going to find a, a relatively good number of, the, uh, of these nitrogen-containing wastes in the, in the plasma. Uh, these are going to be related to um, catabolic byproducts. So anytime your body goes through any sort of breakdown, whether it's glucose to ATP or using protein as a starting source to generate ATP, you get a toxic catabolic byproduct. Basically, this is the leftover stuff after we've gone through that catabolic process, and now we're going to have to get rid of it. And so we're going to find it initially in the bloodstream as it makes its way through the kidneys. So just simply circulating to the kidneys so that they can be excreted. most common metabolic waste product or catabolic byproduct, most common, is going to be a molecule called urea. And this is basically coming from the use of protein as a metabolic starting point. So with that, that's introduction to uh, what the blood actually looks like. I want to I want to talk a little bit more detail about each of these individual cell types or cell elements that we find in a blood cell. Um, and we're going to start with the erythrocytes. So physiologically the erythrocytes have two principal functions. And those two principal functions are going to be related to gas exchange and respiration. The erythrocytes are going to pick up oxygen, and this is going to occur in the lungs, and will circulate and deliver that oxygen into the tissue. And when we talk about the respiratory system, we're actually going to talk about this really unique mechanism where the blood is basically chemically primed once it enters in the lungs to optimally pick up oxygen and then is chemically altered, driving into the tissues to optimize delivery of oxygen to the working tissue. 
the erythrocytes are also going to be responsible to pick up carbon dioxide. And this is going to take place from the tissue and will be expelled or respired to the lungs. So pick up oxygen in the lungs, deliver it to the tissue, pick up CO2 in the tissue, and deliver it to the lungs. Now the anatomy here becomes pretty important. The shape of the red blood cell is discoidal and can be further classified or qualified as a biconcave disc. Okay, so a biconcave disc. And we actually can take a look at that uh, in this cartoon here. So it's discoid. It looks like a pack of CDs or something like that. And then it's biconcave because you have these concave uh, indentations towards the middle of that cell. Now, the reason that this becomes so important is because this cell now has the ability to actually fold up. And it can sort of taco up, so to speak. The reason that's so important is because we get to very, very small diameter capillaries where if the red blood cell doesn't have that ability, it can't make it through the capillary. And it will actually basically bump up against the capillary and get stuck there, and then it undergoes hemolysis, and you begin to lose your red blood cells. So we need to have this sort of discoid shape so that we can induce that change, that flexing that occurs, so that the red blood cell can seamlessly slip through even the smallest capillaries within the human body. So that discoid shape is going to be very important for delivering oxygen to all of our tissues. The cytoplasm inside of a red blood cell cytoplasm. the cytoplasm inside of the red blood cell is actually going to become uh, pretty important as well. So what you're looking at here in this figure is just a model of the blood in close contact to a tissue. So a cell within the tissue and then the red blood cell contained within the tissue of blood. In the cytoplasm, what you're not going to find, you're not going to find a nucleus. You're also not going to find organelle. So no nucleus, no organelles. And that doesn't mean they've never existed. The red blood cell goes through a developmental process that begins in the red marrow of the bone, and we progress from uh, blood stem cells to a red blood cell. At maturation, the red blood cell loses all of its internal organelle, including the nucleus and the genetic material, and then is released into the bloodstream. Sits in the bloodstream for about 120 days before it's considered to be old and then gets recycled. So even though there's no nucleus or organelles present, they were present when the cell was uh, not a red blood cell, your erythrocyte, but rather a blood stem cell um, called an erythroblast. So what are some of the consequences here of no nucleus, no organelles? Well, if there's no organelles, that means there's no mitochondria. And if there is no mitochondria, we have no ability to produce ATP through cellular respiration. So we have no aerobic respiration. If we have no aerobic respiration, we have to get our ATP. We still need the energy. It's not just that we're energy free in the system. We still need the energy. So we need to produce all of our ATP without oxygen, which is sort of ironic because we have trillions of molecules of oxygen bound up on our hemoglobin inside of a red blood cell. But we're not going to use any of it. So we're actually going to produce all of our ATP through anaerobic fermentation. So through anaerobic 
fermentation. So that means we have to have things like lactate dehydrogenase that are going to aid in taking glucose and converting it into pyruvate and then into lactate to generate a very small ATP supply to help power the metabolic needs of the red blood cell. In the cytosol, we're also going to have another enzyme. I'm going to just abbreviate that as CAH. It's carbonic anhydrase. I guess I'll have to spell that out. Okay, so that's carbon carbonic anhydrase. And this particular enzyme is going to catalyze a reaction in which carbon dioxide, where am I getting my carbon dioxide, by the way? Being produced in the tissues, combined with water, so carbon dioxide from the tissue, uh, combined with water, we have a reversible reaction where we generate H2CO3, which is a molecule called uh, carbonic acid. This reaction here, we can run it in either direction. If we need the blood to be more acidic, we're going to generate C, uh, H2CO3. We're going to generate our, our, uh, our, uh, um, our acid. If we have too much acid, if we have too much pH, we want to reduce that, we can run backwards and produce carbon dioxide in water. And this helps us to regulate pH levels in the bloodstream. In addition to the enzymes that are present in uh, the cytosol of the red blood cell, the red blood cell ha also has 280 to 300 million hemoglobin. Okay, so this hemoglobin, again, is this iron-containing protein. It's got four different chains, the L two alpha chains and two beta chains, and it has a prosthetic group that contains iron, Fe2+, that reacts well with oxygen and can carry molecules of oxygen. So you can uh, bind up to four molecules of oxygen to each of these 280 to 300 million hemoglobin in each of your red blood cells. So there's this thing called a prosthetic group. What you see here in purple and in uh, sort of that brownish oranges color, those are amino acid chains. Okay, so those are the chains of the amino acids. A prosthetic group is not an amino acid, but it is an additional chemical compound that the protein binds to, that the amino acids will bind onto. So it's an attachment, just like a prosthesis or a prosthetic limb. This is a prosthetic group that gets attached to the chains of the hemoglobin. That prosthetic group contains uh, an iron. It's, it's actually a ferrous, and so it forms ferrous oxide when uh, the oxygen is bound up to it. And this is how it's actually going to transport the oxygen. Because remember, uh, oxygen, it, it plays okay with water, but not really all that well. And so we'd rather have the oxygen contained within something that's a little bit more hydrophilic, which is going to be our hemoglobin. So the hemoglobin molecule... consists of four globins or globins, two alpha chains and two beta chains. So that's hemoglobin. The globin molecules, the four of them, um, are the protein chains. And then each of these protein chains each contain four heme groups. And those four heme groups contain that ferrous ion, okay, so our iron-containing substance. It's got the plus two charge because we're missing two electrons. There is one heme group per globin, so a total of four heme groups in the molecule. 
And this is where we'll have our reactivity with oxygen so that oxygen can actually bind to and interact with our iron containing prosthetic group. What does that it's, it's just a single ferrous ion in each of the globin molecules or globin chains, protein chains. So we now have that mechanism established to carry oxygen, but we're also going to carry carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide is actually going to be carried on the hemoglobin as well, but it's not actually going to be carried on the prosthetic group. So carbon dioxide, CO2, binds up to the hemoglobin as well, but it's actually going to bind directly to the amino acids or the globin component of the hemoglobin. Now, within the amino acids, there's just uh, certain amino acids that can bind to the carbon dioxide, and it binds the nitrogen-containing amine group in the hemoglobin. So not to the heme group, but rather to the amine, which is the nitrogen side of the amino acid. You have the amine group and you have a carboxyl group on the amino acid. And we're going to bind up on that nitrogen-containing side of the, um, of the hemoglobin. Now, hemoglobin, hemoglobin is a protein, right? What happens when we bind a protein with something else? The protein changes its shape and it leads to a change in function. So whenever you bind carbon dioxide, which is going to primarily be occurring in the tissue, which is right where you want to deliver your oxygen, right? You bind to carbon dioxide and the, the hemoglobin actually has a higher propensity to bind to the carbon dioxide. When carbon dioxide binds up to that amine group on the protein, it causes the hemoglobin to change its shape. The change in function is it reduces the hemoglobin's affinity for the oxygen. And it's really a unique mechanism because it's losing the oxygen or it's reducing its binding affinity for the oxygen right where the oxygen needs to be delivered. So CO2 is being produced in the tissues and it alters the binding characteristics of the hemoglobin to oxygen, allowing oxygen to easily dissociate right where it's needed to be pulled into that working tissue. Everybody good? Okay, so I've already mentioned that the red blood cells are going to remain in the blood uh, for about 120 days, and before they get there, they're being produced in the bone marrow. Uh, so before we move on from our red blood cells, let's talk about how we make a red blood cell. The process of making a red blood cell is called erythropoiesis. Erythropoiesis. Now the picture that you're looking at here, you basically have the individual steps all along the way from our hematopoietic stem cell, so our blood-specific stem cell, to the differentiated erythrocyte. This goes after the, the cytoplasm. Yeah, C was cytoplasm, so D is going to be making a red blood cell. This whole process to go from our hematopoietic stem cell to our mature erythrocyte is roughly a three to five day process. The stem cells, the blood-specific stem cells, we're going to find those in the bone marrow. So this process is going to begin in the marrow found inside of the blood. Now, 
We regulate the whole process by a hormone called erythropoietin, EPO. You've maybe heard this before in reference to drug doping. This was a common um, hormone that was utilized in long-durance athletics, such as tour-style tour uh, bike racing. And they would give themselves erythropoietin and try to increase the red cell mass. Um, so it's a naturally occurring hormone. It's actually produced by the kidneys, and it's going to help to regulate this process. It's going to stimulate the conversion of those stem cells to eventually form our mature red blood cells. Now, what needs to happen here is we actually need to have the red blood cell, uh, the stem cell, I should say, our hematopo hematopoietic stem cell uh, introduced to iron. So we need to incorporate iron. And you can imagine that that iron incorporation is eventually going to be uh, what gets bound up into the hemoglobin as we begin to generate this protein in large quantities. As iron is incorporated by the hematopoietic stem cell, it will stimulate differentiation. So this nonspecific stem cell now begins to take on characteristics that are much more blood-like or red blood cell-like. So from our stem cell, we're going to begin to form erythrocyte, colony, erythrocyte colony forming units. So erythrocyte colony forming units. That's the stem cell, hematopoietic stem cell. Okay, so we're beginning to generate these differentiated cells that now can go on and they can begin to form some very specific cells. Now, one of the things that happens in this differentiation process is the cell begins to express erythropoietin receptors. We can call this the EPO receptor. The EPO is going to be our um, abbreviation for erythropoietin. Since I'm an endocrinologist, it means I'm lazy, so I like to abbreviate. So EPO receptors begin to be expressed in the cell membrane of these now differentiating cells. Once the erythropoietin receptor is present, we now have a mechanism where we can respond to EPO. So EPO being produced by the kidneys is going to cause further differentiation to occur. From the uh, erythrocyte colony forming unit, we are now going to differentiate and begin to produce erythroblasts. And again, this is coming on the heels of EPO. So the presence of EPO is going to begin to generate this differentiation process. Here in this stage of the erythroblasts, after we've differentiated, we increase in just total number of cells and the cell begins to make and produce hemoglobin. So we begin to generate hemoglobin. Now, hemoglobin is a protein, right? So what does that mean as far as genetic material? It's still required. We're getting, two, we have two different genes in our genome for hemoglobin. One gene is for the alpha chain and one gene is for the beta chain. We generate all of the hemoglobin that are going to be present. We now no longer need the genetic material. And so we have our final composition of hemoglobin and our other enzymes, lactate dehydrogenase and uh, carbon, carbonic anhydrase. And so the nucleus disappears. Once the nucleus disappears, 
the differentiated cell that's formed here is called a reticulocyte. Now, with the nucleus gone, that just means we've wiped away the genetic material, but we actually still have large volumes of messenger RNA for these important genes. These are still going to be present. And we still need these, uh, these uh, messenger RNAs to generate the proteins that are required to sustain the, um, the, the red blood cell. So to do this, we keep what's called a polyribosome. You will all remember that the ribosome is our protein translation machinery. This is where messenger RNA is converted into protein. So now with a polyribosome, we just have a bunch of ribosomes that are available and present so that we can generate uh, all of the proteins that we need for a variety of our different enzymes. So polyribosome is present, generating large numbers of proteins that are required for uh, continued survival of the red blood cell. This is also going to be the point here with the reticulocyte where the cell leaves the bone marrow. And we are going to enter into the red blood, uh, I'm sorry, into the bloodstream by way of the extracellular fluid of the bone. So we enter into the into the bloodstream. And as we're doing that, we differentiate one last time. We're going to lose the polyribosome. So we now have pretty much all of the proteins that we're going to require for our 120 remaining days, 120 days remaining for this cell. So polyribosome disappears. We're in the bloodstream, and we're going to call this the mature erythrocyte. Or what you may call an RBC. Yeah, so it's it's going to leave the bone marrow into the extracellular fluid of the bone to be picked up by the plasma and is going to be incorporated into the blood. Okay, so eventually we're going to have this mature red blood cell. It's going to be worn out, and we're not going to be able to uh, as efficiently carry oxygen and catalyze some of those other enzymatic reactions. So we're eventually going to dispose of the erythrocyte. This typically occurs about 120 days after we enter the bloodstream. So red blood cell is going to survive 120 days in the bloodstream. And then it's going to be considered old, and it's going to require breakdown and disposal. It's actually going to be broken down in two different places. Those old red blood cells are going to circulate to the liver and to the spleen. And in both places, in the liver and in the spleen, those cells are going to be broken down. So we're going to split open, lice open the, the uh the cell membrane, and we're going to release the contents. Uh, in, in particular, we're going to re uh, release a very large volume of hemoglobin. And the hemoglobin are going to be subjected to degradation. And as they are degraded, we are just simply breaking up the amino acids, releasing that prosthetic group. And so we're going to have our heme. That's released, and the iron is going to come off, and then that iron is either going to be stored either in the liver or in the spleen, or it's going to be reincorporated into newly developing red blood cells. Uh, some of the iron is also going to be excreted, so it can be released and either reused or stored, or in some cases, we're going to pack it into bile, which will make its way into the feces or the fecal material, and it will be excreted in a bowel movement. 
the amino acid component, the globin, which is the protein, the amino acids, is just simply going to be broken down into individual amino acids, added back into the organism's amino acid pool, and can be incorporated into new proteins. And not necessarily just the red blood cell proteins, but can be incorporated in proteins for the bone, or the liver, or the brain, just get distributed into the organism. All right, when we come back here on Wednesday, we'll continue on with the leukocytes.